This video is about carbohydrate structure and some of the functions of the different carbohydrates. Now there's three main groups of carbohydrates and we'll start with the monosaccharides. So mono suggests one and saccharide refers to sugar. So these are simple sugars and they're determined by the number of carbon atoms they have. So a trio sugar has three carbons. A pento sugar has five carbons and a hexo sugar has six carbon atoms. Now the second group are called the disaccharides. Now di suggests two and saccharide refers to sugar. So we know these disaccharides are made from two monosaccharides linked by what we call a glycosidic bond. We'll uh, draw maltose and you should be able to recognize both sucrose and lactose. Now the polysaccharides are the third group of carbohydrates and these are a bit more complex. So poly means many and saccharide we know means sugar. So these uh, polysaccharides are made from thousands of repeating identical monomers. Now starch we find in plant cells and in organelles called chloroplasts. And starch is a storage uh, polysaccharide for chemical energy in the plant. Cellulose is a structural polysaccharide that we find in plant cell walls. Glycogen is also a storage of chemical energy polysaccharide, but this time we find it in animals, in liver and skeletal muscle cells. And lastly, chitin is a um, structural polysaccharide that we find in arthropod exoskeletons and also fungal cell walls. One of the most well known of the carbohydrates or the simple sugars is glucose and that's C6H12O6. Now plant cells can make their own food, they can actually make glucose, and this predominantly occurs in the leaf. Now the carbon in glucose originally comes from carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now the carbon dioxide gets inside the air spaces of the leaf through the open stomatal pores. And once it's inside the leaf, it can actually dissolve in a thin film of water that covers cells that we call spongy mesophyll cells, but also palisade mesophyll cells. So carbon dioxide can actually diffuse into the plant cells in the leaf, and there they're gonna move into organelles that we call chloroplasts. Now inside the chloroplast, that's where the glucose is actually made by photosynthesis. Now the other raw material for photosynthesis is water, and that gets into the leaf through the xylem vessels. Now the energy that ends up as chemical energy inside the glucose molecule originally comes from sunlight. Now another waste product of this reaction is oxygen gas. Now most of the oxygen gas that gets produced will actually exit the leaf through the stomatal pore. However, not only do plant cells make their own food, glucose, but they're also going to utilize this glucose to release the, the chemical energy within it. Now, in some of the same cells or some other cells of the, the plant, the glucose is then broken down through what we call aerobic respiration. And we know that's going to involve some molecular oxygen. Now, one of the waste products of respiration from all the plant cells is carbon dioxide, and that will have to be released. Some of it can actually be used in photosynthesis if it's inside spongy or palisade mesophyll cells in the leaf, for example. Now, water is a waste product of aerobic respiration, but the energy that was originally wrapped up in the glucose molecule uh, gets converted into many, many ATP molecules that get made from the mitochondria of the plant cells. Now ATP is a carrier of energy inside cells and it only carries small little packets of energy but that's enough for certain processes to take place, things like maybe active transport. The first of the monosaccharides that we're going to talk about is the trio sugars. Now if we look at the molecular structure of a trio sugar, we can see straight away that it's actually got three carbon atoms. So we can highlight these on the actual diagram itself. Now we also know that there's gonna be six hydrogen atoms. So we can go one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogen atoms. Now if we look at the uh, chemical formula, we can also see there's three oxygens. So we're gonna go one, two, three. C3H6O3 is a trio sugar, and these are the simplest of the monosaccharides. 
One of the roles of the triO sugars are as intermediates in what we call glycolysis, and that is the first stage of the breakdown of glucose. Now we know glucose is made inside cells in the leaf of the plant, but these cells also have to then break down the glucose like we said earlier. Now humans are mammals and we are holozoic feeders, so we actually take in glucose through our diet. And across the small intestine wall, the glucose gets absorbed into the blood and then it will get absorbed into all the cells of our body. So we can't make our own glucose, but we have to ingest it as part of our diet. But the, the process of respiration is actually very similar between uh, plant cells and human cells. And this glucose gets broken down in a number of little steps. Now, if you look halfway down this diagram, and we'll do this in more detail in the respiration topic, hopefully what you can see is that the six carbon glucose at the top has been broken down into three carbon triosugars, and these are called triose phosphate. So we can see these are the intermediates in the breakdown of glucose that is going to release some of the energy that was wrapped up initially in that glucose molecule. Now the next type of monosaccharide is called the pento sugar. Okay, so we need to be able to identify pento sugars, and the best way of doing that is by looking at the chemical formula. Now, C5H10O5, we know it must have five carbon atoms, so we can actually highlight these in the molecular structure that we're given on the left-hand side. Now, all five carbon atoms are connected via covalent bonds. Now, we're going to call this the carbon backbone. If we look at the hydrogen atoms, we know there's going to be 10 hydrogen atoms within this pento sugar. So if we're given the diagram, we can have a quick um, look through the structure. We can quickly label and count all 10 hydrogen atoms. And then we can also look at the oxygens. So we know there's going to be five oxygen. So one, two, three, four top left here. And lastly, the number five oxygen. Now this number five oxygen is um, a little bit different to the others because it's actually covalently bonded to the number four carbon over here on the left and, and the number one carbon on the right hand side and that produces a pentagon like structure called a ring structure which is actually very stable. Now the function of the pento sugars, um, it forms part of what we call nucleic acids so both DNA and RNA have uh, pento sugars in their structure. Now, when we look at DNA, we know it's double-stranded. Now, the two strands are called polynucleotide strands, and they run what we call anti-parallel. So the second strand here on the left-hand side from the bottom up will run in the opposite direction as the first strands that we had. Now, we know each polynucleotide strand has nitrogenous bases as part of its structure. Now, the uh, anti-parallel strands will have complementary base pairs that hydrogen bond to each other okay, in the middle of the DNA double helix. But if we actually look at the structure of the polynucleotide chain, the backbone is made from, if we just highlight the pentagons here, uh, a pento sugar called deoxyribose. So we've got many, many of these subunits all the way down the DNA uh, polynucleotide chain and they are deoxyribose pento sugars. Now the deoxyribose pento sugars are linked by these round structures that are um, colour in yellow called phosphate groups. So the backbone of this chain is called the sugar phosphate backbone that we can see here. Now, there's two sugar phosphate backbones that run anti-parallel to each other that gives us the DNA double helix. Now, RNA has a single-stranded structure, and the pento sugar in RNA is not deoxyribose, it's just ribose sugar. Now, ATP is a simple nucleotide. Now, it does have a pento sugar, but that's also, similar to RNA, a ribose sugar. Next, we're going to talk about the hexo sugars. So again, we're going to look at the chemical formula, and we know there's six carbon atoms. So we're going to quickly circle them here in the uh, molecular diagram. Right, the number six carbon atom projects upwards from the number five carbon atom. Now, 
if we look at the hydrogens we know there's going to be 12 so if we were to count them in the structure we would definitely always see 12 hydrogen atoms so 8 9 10 11 and 12 down here at the bottom now the oxygens then we can also look at those and count them so here on the uh, right hand side the oxygen is part of what we call a hydroxyl group or OH group now the oxygen is bonded to carbon 1 and then it will have a hydrogen atom bonded um, to it as well now this is going to be oxygen number 2 3 4 5 and lastly oxygen number 6 now this oxygen atom is actually covalently bonded to carbon number 5 on the left and also carbon number one on the right hand side and that forms a hexagon like ring structure now this structure is nice and stable which is why we f we see this version of um, hexose or glucose as it is in nature now in some textbooks you see this structure on the left hand side and that's called an open chain or branched version now it's still C6H12O6 because it is glucose and we can pop in the numbers for each of the carbon atoms so 1 to 6 however in nature we don't really tend to find this branched structure because it's very very unstable and the first thing it would do is form the ring structure that we find on the right hand side so if we put in the carbon numbers here on the right we can see carbon 1 through to carbon 6 with carbon 6 projecting above carbon 5 now this is a shorthand version of glucose because they haven't actually put in the carbon atoms um, and they haven't actually included some of the hydrogens that are bonded to those carbons but they do exist and this is just a quick way of drawing a glucose molecule now we can see carbon 1 is bonded to the oxygen in the ring which is bonded to carbon 5 so if we go back to the left hand side we can actually look at carbon 1 here at the top now we know that's bonded to the oxygen uh, bonded to carbon 5 so here's the oxygen and then on the left of that is carbon 5 so what would happen in nature is that we get a link between carbon 1 and the oxygen of this hydroxyl group and hopefully you can start to see this is going to take the shape of the nice stable ring structure now sometimes what we see is if two molecules have exactly the same chemical formula so hexo sugars C6H12O6 but a different arrangement of their atoms we're going to call these isomers now if we draw in the um, carbon atoms from this glucose molecule we know there's six now carbon one we can see the OH group or hydroxyl group points down and that's going to give us the alpha glucose version of um, this hexose now if you look at the diagram on the right hand side we can actually see attached to carbon one the OH group points upwards and then we can pop in the rest of the carbon numbers here and they're exactly the same but on carbon one the OH group points up now here on carbon one the hydrogen atom would point down in the beta version and if we go back to the alpha version the hydrogen atom on carbon one would point upwards so these OH groups have a different orientation attached to carbon 1 in both alpha and beta glucose. Now a good way of trying to remember this is the 70s pop band or group ABBA. So A stands for alpha and B stands for below. So in alpha glucose we've got the OH group below carbon 1. Then the next B stands for beta and A stands for above. So in ABBA, A, B, alpha below, B, A, beta above. So in beta glucose, the OH group is above the carbon 1. Now we're going to talk about the disaccharides next. And in particular, you have to know how to draw maltose, but then be able to sort of recognize um, and talk about sucrose and lactose. So this is a disaccharide that's going to form through what we call a condensation reaction. So on the left hand side we've got an alpha glucose and we know that's alpha because on carbon 1 we've got the OH group that points down and on the right hand side we've also got alpha glucose and it's exactly the same on carbon 1 the OH group points down on carbon 1 
but this time we're going to form a link between the carbon 1 of the left hand alpha glucose and carbon 4 of the right hand alpha glucose. Now if we look at the two OH groups we should be able to see that the hydrogen atom of the OH group on the left is going to be removed and the OH group on the right hand side is also going to be removed and we call this a condensation reaction where an enzyme would catalyze the removal of water. So what we end up with beneath is the actual disaccharide itself and you should be able to see that carbon 1 is now attached via an oxygen atom to carbon 4. Now because the OH group was on carbon 1 that points down on the left hand glucose we're going to call that alpha and it's between carbon 1 and carbon 4 of the next glucose so it's an alpha 1 to 4 glycosidic bond. Now in the exam you have to remember to draw in the molecule of water because that also is a product from this particular reaction not just the disaccharide itself. So we know maltose and how to draw that so let's have a quick look at the carbon atoms here so we've got one two three four five and six and we know the six carbon pops up at the top here compared to number five we know carbon one is on the right hand side now the OH group that would have been attached to carbon one prior to maltose forming is below carbon one so we know that must be alpha glucose and if we have a look on the right hand side this time to the the monomer here we can actually see on carbon one the OH group does actually point up so we know this actually would have been beta glucose so here we've got an alpha 1 to 4 glycosidic bond that links alpha glucose on the left hence alpha 1 to 4 and a beta glucose on the right hand side so maltose could either be two alpha glucose molecules together or an alpha and a beta glucose linked together now on the right hand side of this page we can see lactose so if we look at the monomer on the left hand side of lactose and we put in the carbon numbers so again 1 to 6 five and six at the top now we can see actually on carbon number four there's an OH or hydroxyl group and that projects above carbon four but if we look at glucose either alpha or beta we know the OH group on carbon four is always down whether it's alpha or beta glucose so this sugar here on the left hand side of uh, lactose is not glucose it's actually what we call galactose now galactose will form a 1 to 4 1 to 4 glycosidic bond with glucose now if we put in the carbons for glucose 1 to 6 we know the OH group is on carbon 1 above that carbon atom so we know that must be beta glucose so here we've got a disaccharide formed between galactose and beta glucose now we know lactose is actually being it's made in the milk of mammalian females to feed to their offspring and we know the milk contains lots of beneficial uh, molecules like antibodies and some hormones but it also has high levels of lactose and that's the major source of energy for these uh, rapidly developing offspring now sucrose at the bottom is another disaccharide and if we look at the monomer on the left hand side and put all the carbons in we know that the number six projects above carbon five we know on carbon one the OH group would have been below the carbon one prior to formation of the glycosidic bond so this must be alpha glucose on the left but on the right hand side it looks initially like a pento sugar because there is a pentagon ring however if we actually count the carbon atoms we're going to start this time at the top here so it goes one two three four five and then six at the bottom so the carbon backbone here would go this way one to two to three to four to five to six so this is not actually a pento sugar it's actually a hexo sugar and we call it fructose now the link between carbon 1 and carbon 2 is an alpha because on the left we've got alpha glucose alpha 1 to 2 glycosidic bond now this uh, 
sugar on the right hand side or this monomer on the right hand side we know it's fructose okay but sucrose is slightly different to the other uh, disaccharides because we call sucrose a non reducing sugar so maltose and lactose we both could use a benedict's test to show they're potentially present because they're both reducing sugars now the benedict's test what we do is we add the benedict's reagent to your sample you provide a little bit of heat maybe in a boiling water bath and you will see a color change from light blue to brick red now if we did that for sucrose we would not see a color change the solution would remain light blue so in order to possibly test for sucrose we'd have to do a modified benedict's test and for that one what you need to do is add a little tiny bit of acid dilute acid like hydrochloric acid dilute heat it in a water bath that will hydrolyze the glycosidic bond and that will separate the two monomers so the alpha glucose on the left and the fructose on the right you then neutralize with a little bit of alkali and then you carry out a benedict's test now if you add benedict's reagent with a little bit of heat boiling water bath you will get light blue to brick red color because we've now got two monosaccharides that we know are reducing sugars present now we're going to start talking about the polysaccharides and the first one is called starch now starch is a plant polysaccharide used to store chemical energy and it's got thousands of alpha glucose uh, monomers that make up its structure now there's two polysaccharides in starch and the first one is called amylose now if we look at the structure of amylose we know it's got alpha glucose monomers down its length and we can actually put in the carbon numbers as we would always do so five and six now on carbon one the OH group would have looked or pointed down prior to forming this glycosidic bond so we know if we put in the next set of numbers on the next alpha glucose that we're going to have an alpha one to four glycosidic bond that links the two monomers together and we'll get many many of these glycosidic bonds all the way down this particular chain structure now the straight chain uh, coils in this case for amylose and we end up with this helical structure and we find amylose really in the core of the starch grain now on the outside of the starch grain we find a more branched uh, polysaccharide called amylopectin now this is also made of alpha glucose monomers as we can see from the diagram and we know when they're joined together um, at the top here we can put in the numbers one two six now the glycosidic bond is going to be an alpha one to four glycosidic bond because the next monomer it will be the fourth carbon atom there that makes the link now the difference is this point here so the carbon one of this particular glucose monomer we can have a look at in more detail now that's going to form a glycosidic bond with the number six carbon of the alpha glucose below so this one is going to be called an alpha one to six glycosidic bond and these form branch points um, from the chain like structure so we can actually highlight the branch points here so this is where a chain will actually split into two other chains now the whole point of this uh, branch structure is that the reverse of condensation is the addition by an enzyme of water to break or hydrolyze the glycosidic bonds now if that enzyme uh, catalyzes this hydrolysis reaction it will release the glucose from the end of this branch but if there are multiple enzymes all catalyzing the same reaction at the same time it results in the simultaneous release of glucose from the ends of all the branches now if this plant cell needs to perform a certain process maybe like cell division it's going to need glucose for that and it will break down the glucose through respiration but that glucose needs to be released from this storage polysaccharide first which is why amylopectin is found on the outside of the starch grain now we're going to look at cellulose next 
Now this polysaccharide is a structural polysaccharide that we find in plant cell walls. And the monomers, if we actually have a quick look this time, so one to six, four, five, and six, uh, the number one carbon here on the right hand side, the OH group initially would have been above carbon one. So that's why we call this beta glucose. Now the second uh, beta glucose in this portion of the polysaccharide uh, chain, if we look at the carbons here quite carefully, the carbon two this time is up on the top part of the structure. So carbon two, three, four, five, and six. So this time carbon six projects uh, from the bottom of the structure. So this is gonna be a beta one to four glycosidic bond because it's between two beta glucose monomers. But the second beta glucose is rotated by 180 degrees and you can see that if we actually draw in the uh, carbon backbone so from one to two to three to four to five and lastly down to six it's a rotated version of the beta glucose at position one okay so if we go one two three four now the third um beta glucose in this portion of the polypeptide it will have the same orientation as number one so we can see there carbon six at the top so this glycosidic bond here again it's exactly the same it's a beta one to four glycosidic bond but the next and the last uh, glucose monomer that we have in this particular part of the chain at the end when we count the carbons it's going to be the same as number two so if we put in the carbon backbone, we're going to see one to two to three to four to five and down at six. So this one is also rotated 180 degrees. So in cellulose, what we say is that every other beta glucose is rotated 180 degrees. And the point of this is that these straight chains, there's no coiling or branching at all. They're very straight uh, polymer chains. Now, because every other beta glucose is rotated 180 degrees, the adjacent straight chains can hydrogen bond with each other. So you can see these blue lines at the bottom are weak intermolecular hydrogen bonds. Now that holds the straight chains collectively tightly together. And we're gonna call this structure a microfibril. So in the middle of this uh, page, we can see the straight chains of cellulose polymers. And we know the straight chains are cross-linked by hydrogen bonds to form a microfibril. Now, if we've got many microfibrils, that will form what we call a macrofibril. And these macrofibrils can come together to form cellulose fibers. Now in the diagram on the top left, the green picture, we can actually see the cellulose fibers forming the cellulose cell wall of the plant cell. Now, even though this is a very uh, strong, high tensile strength, inelastic material, so the cell wall doesn't actually flex very much at all, it's very inelastic. It does have, you can see in the diagram, little pores in it. So the cellulose cell wall is fully permeable to both water and mineral ions and they will flow down the cell wall in what we call the apoplast pathway so it's very strong and very tough and inelastic but water can actually move through it through the little pores it's fully permeable to water and minerals now the next uh, polysaccharide is called glycogen now we know glycogen is found in animal cells in the liver cells and the skeletal muscle cells now this is kind of similar to amylopectin, however, it's actually even more branched than amylopectin. So we can put in the branch points here in this uh, diagram of glycogen. So you can see there's many of them. Now we know the branch points um, on this polysaccharide will be due to alpha one to six glycosidic bonds. So I'll just write in glycosidic for you, glycosidic bonds now the reason for this is similar to amylopectin but even more so now enzymes can hydrolyze the last glucose monomer from the ends of all the branches simultaneously 
if you've got if there's enough enzymes within this uh, cell now we know that's going to release the uh, glucose from the ends of the branches and we know that's going to get used in respiration i.e broken down to release energy to help make atp now we know animals like mammals and humans we we move and the muscle cells require energy from atp to be able to contract plants don't move so humans require glycogen storages in their skeletal muscle and also the liver cells because the rapid release of glucose more so than amylopectin results in more atp that can be used for muscle contraction so if we actually look at the structure of um, glycogen we know it's made of alpha glucose and we know that because if we put in the numbers of carbons one two three four five and six the number one carbon would have the oh group pointing down prior to formation of the glycosidic bond and we know from this second monomer it's going to be a four so it's an alpha one to four glycosidic bond now if we go here we know that's carbon one and underneath we know this is carbon six of the other alpha glucose so here the oxygen is going to form an alpha one to six branch point which is what we said earlier right the last um, polysaccharide is chitin now we find chitin in insect uh, exoskeletons we also find it in um, arachnid exoskeletons and crustacean exoskeletons now these are three classes that we find within the arthropod phylum so it's quite a nice uh, feature to use as a characteristic of the arthropods an external uh, skeleton made of chitin and you can see here this is the chitin we can see it covering the legs as well we know insects have three pairs of legs that extend from the thorax also on the head region here is chitin now we know um, insects um, have to molt the exoskeleton in order to grow now because chitin is similar to cellulose in many respects we know it's inelastic and it's rigid and it's very strong now for that insect to get bigger it has to molt the exoskeleton and when it does so it will grow back a new exoskeleton but initially it's quite soft and flexible so when it's in that state the insect can actually grow quite rapidly until it hardens again and then normally it will go through another molting stage now below here we can see a crustacean this is obviously a crab now this is the chitin exoskeleton here and we can also see it on the legs here and the pincers so the uh, the structure of chitin then it's very similar to cellulose so we know it's going to be made of beta glucose monomers so here we've got three of them but we'd actually have thousands of them now we can actually put in the carbon numbers as we would always do so one to six and we know six pops up at the top from carbon five now if we look at this oxygen it's going to form okay this is where it gets a bit different here so it's one two three four five and six and that's a beta one to four linkage or glycosidic bond which is the same however if you look at the number two carbon on the second um, beta glucose monomer we can actually see it's not an OH group as we would normally expect it's actually what we call an N acetyl amine group so the OH group that we would normally find on carbon number two is replaced by an N uh, acetyl amine group now this is a, uh, a modified beta glucose monomer and we call it glucosamine so chitin is a polymer made of uh, many thousands of glucosamine monomer units linked together by alpha 1 to 4 glycosidic bonds now the point of this is that um, uh, the chitin straight chain polymers can form many more hydrogen bonds compared to those of cellulose so we know the chitin exoskeleton for example will be even tougher and even stronger compared to a plant cell wall now we can see this here in this last picture now these are the straight chain polymers in chitin and we know they cross link by hydrogen bonds now collectively they're going to form what we call microfibrils now the microfibrils also come together to form the macrofibrils on the right hand side here 
and the macrofibrils will orientate in a certain uh, manner and we will get here the thick exoskeleton that we find on the outside in this case of crustaceans such as the lobster.